Hello ladies and gentlemen welcome to Triple N Media I am Dr Nick Nickam I have been a cardiologist in Houston for more than 40 years uh, this focus presentation is on atrial septal defect ACC AHA 2018 guidelines diagnosis and management medical management device or surgery so we're going to learn the whole concept of how to use these guidelines at bedside in clinical practice in your office setting or in the hospital so this is more geared for primary care doctors cardiologists fellows residents students uh, to understand the basic concepts of uh, what are the parameters that are used in diagnosing the atrial septal defect and how do we determine who needs what so let us continue with the feature presentation before i dwell into the guidelines flow chart i want to give you a basic concept of what we are talking about basically the atrial septal defect is a hole between the left and the right atria through the interatrial septal septum the most common type is the secundum type of atrial septal defect which is located right here in the middle of the atrial septum and if it happens to be close to the superior vena cava it is called the superior sinus venous defect similarly we have the inferior sinus venous defect then we have the coronary sinus venous defect we also have a normal opening which is known as the primum atrial septal defect which is like a flap from the left over uh, sept primum septum so that is usually not the case but it can be in some cases however how do we determine as what are the parameters that we need to use to make a clinical decision as to if somebody needs a medical treatment device treatment or a surgical treatment it depends upon their symptoms shortness of breath do they have cardiac arrhythmia with rapid ventricular response like atrial fibrillation does this patient have pulmonary hypertension does this patient have heart failure did this patient present with a cryptic stroke that is a blood clot on the right side of the heart to getting to the left atrium and then going to the brain and causing a cryptic stroke next we need to determine the anatomic location we need to look at the size of the defect the location of the defect and the direction of the blood flow is the blood flowing from the left side to the right or is it flowing from the right side to the left how can it flow from right side to the left that happens in advanced cases where there is pulmonary hypertension with the pulmonary systolic pressure being greater than aortic pressure then we see a reversal of the shunt which is sort of a end stage uh, condition then we need to look at the qpqs ratio this is an important uh, terminology we need to be familiar with qp is the the flow across the pulmonary circuit over flow across the systemic circuit circuit and determine the ratio which is an important number used to decide whether they need to be treated with a device or surgery then as i said pulmonary artery pressure is of great importance if somebody has developed significant pulmonary hypertension they may not benefit from any device or procedure therapy or surgery and that's why echocardiography is the central theme in diagnosing the location of the atrial septal defect the size of the atrial septal defect the hemodynamics uh, hemodynamic effects of the atrial hemodynamic effects of the atrial septal defect and how well we can fix that in the cath lab with the help of of course echo to the echo cardiography or tee so that uh, it can be done without surgical intervention let's keep that in mind now now we're going to move on to what is this qpqs ratio when there is an atrial septal defect when the left atrium contracts part of the blood gets into the right side and it increases the right ventricular outflow volume as you can see the qp is 12 and the qs is 4 liters 12 liters over 4 liters you have a qp ratio of 3 in order for device or surgical intervention all we need is a qp qs ratio of greater than 1.5 this is an important number which we will come across on the flow chart guidelines 
one other thing that we usually don't talk about in the present day, but this is how it was diagnosed uh, in the 80s and 90s when I was doing heart catheterization uh, in these patients. We were looking at their oxygen saturation to determine the QPQS ratio and also to determine whether we're having a left to right shunt or a right to left shunt. Normally, the right side of the heart has an oxygen saturation of 75 to 76 percent, whereas on the left side of the heart, the oxygen saturation from pulmonary veins, left atrium, left ventricle, and aorta are in the range of 95 percent. However, in patients with the left to right shunt, the oxygen saturation can bump a step up in oxygen saturation from the superior vena cava to the right atrium or from the inferior vena cava to the right atrium is an indication that we have an atrial septal defect accounting for flow of blood, oxygenated blood from the left atrium into the right atrium. So that is an indication. If the shunt is at the ventricular level, the atrial saturation would be still 75 and the ventricular saturation will be showing the step up. Anyway, so that's uh, one extra bonus point there. Let's move on. Now, echocardiography, as I said, is the hallmark of diagnosing the entire information we need to decide on whether this patient needs any treatment, what kind of treatment they need. I'm not, I'm talking about, they all need medical treatment. Let's not ignore that. They need rhythm control, rate control. They need symptom control. And we need to see if they are having symptoms of cryptic stroke, which needs to be addressed. Now here's a, an echocardiography, which is a modified four chamber view. And we can see there's a large defect uh, in the left uh, atrium or the uh, atrial septum. In, we just can't go by one diagram here. And there are a lot of other things we can do because, there, because the beam is coming this way. Sometimes we see dropouts of the echoes. So, uh, a color flow Doppler will show us the amount of uh, the regurgitation, the amount of shunt from the left side to the right side. And by taking their velocities, we can measure the QPQS ratio. And at the same time, we can also measure the pulmonary artery pressure by using 2D echocardiography. And here's another example of a transesophageal echocardiography where we see the left atrium close to the transducer and we have the right atrium. As you can see, the right atrium is grossly dilated here and we have a central jet. So it tells us very exactly the atrial septal defect is and that can be very useful in deciding what kind of device we put, how big the device should be, and how exactly to position the atrial septal device. So we look at this one, and we also look at the amount of uh, shunt by using the QPQS ratio, which I talked about, or the velocity in this case. Once we have this, the treatment options that are available would be medical management, rate and rhythm control if the patient has atrial fibrillation and heart failure control if they have evidence of pulmonary hypertension and heart failure and of course atrial septal defect closure device or surgical closure with this amount of information that is uh, available and here is uh, some more additional information in terms of uh, device closure and here's a device which is shown in a diagrammatic uh, manner and this is the kind of device that is going to be used. The devices have evolved over a period of time and these are the different types of devices that are used and this is the most commonly used device at the present time and you can see this is the left atrial side and this is the right atrial side and the two discs are sort of uh, compressed together and it closes the gap. In order for a device to be used, first of all, we need to have the device that can be placed in, in a proper location. So atrial, atrial, secundum atrial septal defect is the ideal one. The, the size of the opening should be reasonable. If it's too large, the device may not fit or there could be leak around the device. And we also need at least five millimeters of these shafts at the top and the bottom for the device to properly anchor. If the, the if the opening is very close here, then the device may not be able to co-apt very closely 
and that may not help. So these are all technical matters. And how do we decide who, do, who needs atrioceptal defect closure by device? First of all, they have a ostium secundum defect. The size is less than 40 millimeters. At least we have five millimeter rim on the edges. PA pressure is less than two thirds of the systemic pressure and the pulmonary vascular resistance is two-thirds of the systemic uh, vascular resistance. If these criteria are met, then a device treatment may be an option for these patients. Okay, then this, of course, the invasive procedure is the surgical uh, procedure where we open up the right atrium. We can look at the hole here, and this is closed with a graft patch, and the atrium is closed. So that's the surgical closure. Having all this basic knowledge in our mind, now let us look at the flowchart from the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association that was published in 2018 for atrioceptal defect. It makes it so easy to understand this chart once we understand the basic concepts of what are the parameters that are used to decide what needs to be done. First of all, we have a secundum atrioceptal defect. That's what we are dealing with. A shunt. Is this a left to right shunt? Let's say yes. Hemodynamic assessment. Pulmonary vascular resistance. One third of the systemic vascular resistance. That's good. Number two, pulmonary artery systolic pressure less than 50% of the systemic pressure. Okay, that is good. The right heart enlargement. And the shunt is large enough. QPQS ratio greater than 1 is to 1.5 is to 1. If this is met, if these criteria are met, then we have a functional impairment of the atrioceptal defect that is causing the symptoms and also the complications like cardiac enlargement, atrial fibrillation, pulmonary hypertension, and the list goes on. And then we have two options surgical closure or device closure. The, see, since I already showed you all these things, this looks like a piece of cake in terms of making a decision. Uh, if the, they have no functional impairment, we can still consider, but that is class two. Again, it has to be determined based upon patient symptomatology. Is the patient uh, physical activity curtailed because of this atrioceptal defect? Is a patient developing significant pulmonary hypertension and can we prevent that one? So those are some of the things that will come into play. Now, if the hemodynamic assessment shows uh, that the pulmonary vascular resistance is greater than one third of the systemic resistance and the pulmonary artery pressure is uh, greater than 50% of the systemic pressure, that means now we are talking about uh, fixed changes in the pulmonary vascular bed leading to pulmonary hypertension, then we need to consult uh, people who deal with pulmonary hypertension and then make a decision as whether a device or a surgical closure is going to help these patients. And this is a class 2B indication. The results are plus minus. Keep that in mind. If this is a right to left shunt, that is Isingmenger syndrome, that is, we had atrial septal defect, which usually starts off with a left to right shunt as the pulmonary pressure starts going up and it goes beyond the systemic pressure. Then we have reversal of the flow going from the right side to the left side. And this is uh, confirmed by the presence of a pulmonary arterial hypertension by invasive procedures, by right heart catheterization, or even with uh, echocardiography. If this happens and the patient is having icing menger syndrome then we have to try medications that dilate pulmonary arteries and try to reduce the pulmonary vascular resistance and the medications available for this category are uh, Vicentin, Vicentin, PDE5 inhibitors a combination of these drugs and uh, a closure of atrioceptal defect is not indicated and this is an important question that we may get on board a patient with pulmonary hypertension is symptomatic and what would you do surgery device closure medical treatment or uh, pde inhibitors and quickly we jump to surgical closure uh, device closure and that is the wrong answer so keep that in mind because 
Once we understand the basic concepts of what is atrioceptal defect and how it manifests, how do we determine which one is significant and which one needs treatment, what is the appropriate treatment and how we manage that. So ladies and gentlemen, this is a quick synopsis of the atrioceptal defect and the atrioceptal defect uh, flowchart. Thank you so much for watching this presentation. I have a series of presentations on ACC AHA guidelines, uh, most up to date being the one for heart failure that was just published in 2022. We had more than 500 views on that uh, video. Please do watch that one because this is useful for medical students, internal medicine residents, primary care doctors, cardiologists, cardiology fellows, and every practicing physician who deals with patients with heart failure and other conditions. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and I will see you in the next presentation. Thank you so much for watching.